All right, am I good? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so I'm Michaela. Full disclosure, I am pregnant, so if I get short of breath, it's just the baby sucking air out of me. I'm okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have been here about a year and a half, a little over. Otherwise, my experience is long-term care before this job. I still do long-term care one day a week, too. I work here four days a week. Um, here I do a little bit of everything, hospital, clinic, um, see chemo patients, cardiac rehab, so a little bit of everything. This presentation too is geared a little bit towards older adults. That being said, it's kind of broad that it could apply to anybody to just general healthy eating, but is geared a little bit towards the older adult. So today we're going to talk about protein, fiber, um, sodium, and kind of how we can reduce our sodium intake, hydration, and then cooking for one or two. Um, and then I also have a little bit about food preparation. Before I get to my next slide, does anybody have any guesses as to what food groups Americans eat enough of or don't eat enough of? Enough bread? Bingo. We got one. How about any other food group? Fat. <laughs> kind of, sort of. Um, there's one other food group I'm thinking of, though, that we do get enough of. Not dairy. Protein. Yep, yep, the meats and the protein. So this data, I wanted to note, is a little outdated. It's going to be 2013 to 2016, but this is for ages one or older in the U.S. and our average intakes. So as you can see, we do pretty good in the breads or the grains category. That being said, we don't get enough whole grains. It's actually recommended that most Americans get at least half of their grains as whole grains. So we don't do a super great in that category. We get a lot of the f refined greens. Um, we do pretty good in the protein too. We do good with the meat, poultry, eggs, seafood. We don't do that great in. And same with nuts, seeds, and soy products. So I thought that was kind of interesting to kind of then transition into what we're talking about today. So that being said, we don't get enough of the fruit, vegetables, and dairy. Um, I mean, we don't really do good at any vegetables, sadly. Um, fruits, not very good either, and same with dairy. So, Okay, how can we pro improve? Does anybody regularly look at the nutrition facts label? One, two, three, four, kind of, sort of? Okay. So they revamped this and I think it was 2016. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later and what they improved. But these four nutrients at the bottom of the nutrition facts label is generally what Americans don't get enough of. That's why they're on there. It used to have like vitamin A and C. We really aren't deficient in those. So they switched those up when they redid the label. Um, so, let's see, calcium's on there. Calcium's good to keep our bones and our teeth strong. Um, it also, yep, our bones. So after age 30, we actually no longer build any more bone. We start kind of slowly decreasing bone because we're reabsorbing, reabsorbing more than we're actually building. So that's why calcium is important as we age. Same with vitamin D. Vitamin D and calcium kind of work together hand in hand to keep that bone strength up. So up here I've got different sources of calcium and vitamin D. I also have it on your guys' handout as well. Um, but sunlight, I like to point this out too. Vitamin D, sunlight is mostly where we get it. We synthesize it from the sun. And where do we live? <laughs> <laughs> and it's dark like six months out of the year, right? So most of the time providers like recommend we take a supplement over the winter months because we can't get enough or it's too cold to get enough. 
So that's just saying exposing our hands, face, and arms for about five to 10 minutes. So that's two to three times a week can get us sufficient vitamin D, I'd say, when it's warmer out. And then people who are dark skinned, they require a little more sun exposure just due to the melanin in their skin. Um, let's see. Potassium's also on the bottom there. Potassium's important to help maintain our blood pressure. It's also an electrolyte in our body that helps with functioning of a lot of different things, whether it's our muscles, so our heart's a muscle too, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> here's potassium sources. The big ones I think of when I think of potassium is bananas, potatoes, oranges, tomatoes. But here's some other ones up here as well. A lot of the orange fruits or veggies. Protein. Um, I do have a few visuals for this one too, because I have equivalent to one ounce servings up here. Um, protein helps prevent loss of lean muscle mass with natural aging. Unfortunately, as we age, we just tend to lose lean muscle mass and gain fat mass. That's just how it is. Um, so we want to try to get enough in to keep that muscle mass up. Average intakes for adults is about five and a half to six ounces a day. Um, so these up here are going to be one ounce equivalents. So one egg is one ounce. Um, I brought a peanut butter. I stole it from the cafeteria. This is about one ounce. It's 0 0.75. So maybe a tish more than this would be one ounce or that one tablespoon of peanut butter. A fourth cup of beans is going to be one ounce. So not that much. And then my picture up here, deck of cards is actually generally like a three ounce portion of meat. So about two of these a day, or the size of the palm of your hand, but everyone's hands are a little different sizes, right? Um, otherwise, a three, three ounce serving of fish is gonna be a checkbook size. It's a little longer. <clears throat> Let's see. As we age too, we decrease the ability to absorb vitamin B12. And that has to do with we don't um, uh, produce as much acid in our stomach to absorb it as we age. But vitamin B12 is going to be found a lot in those animal products. So the meats, eggs, poultry, they can be found in fortified breakfast cereals as well. Mm -hmm. Iron we're talking about is because that was on the bottom of that nutrition facts label. One of those nutrients we tend to be deficient in. It's also going to be found in the meats, fish, nuts, can be found in beans as well. And these are some sources that are not necessarily meat sources. Iron just helps keep us feeling kind of energized. It has to do with our hemoglobin to a protein in our blood that carries oxygen through our body. So when that's low, our hemoglobin can be low and we can be fatigued, tire out easily, that sort of thing. <clears throat> and then my next topic is going to be a fiber. Does anybody know where we find fiber? Bingo, fruits, vegetables. There's one other big one I'm thinking of. Bingo, yep, whole grains, which we don't get enough of. So, fiber, there's two different types of fiber. One's gonna be called soluble fiber. That one kind of dissolves to form a gel type substance. An example of that is pectin in fruit, which is used to thicken jellies. Insoluble fiber, it does not really dissolve. So okay, that kind of makes up the bulk of our stool kind of just passes through us. That's going to be things like corn kernels and the strings of celery. Um, fibers in those plant-derived foods that you guys brought up, the fruits, veggies, whole grains. It's important it can reduce cardiovascular disease, help with diabetes, um, help with digestion, keeps our bowels regular, helps protect against colon cancer, how it helps with the body weight piece is um, fiber helps fill us up to keep us fuller longer, that satiety piece, which can help with weight loss. 
I didn't mention that with the protein, but protein does the same thing too. Um, so that's the weight loss piece or healthy body weight. And then AI recommendations, that's going to be adequate intake recommendations. That's just what those age ranges should get in a day. So about 21 grams to anywhere to 38 grams a day. So how do we increase our fiber? Um, we want to do it slowly, actually. If we do it too much, too quickly, we can get constipated, which nobody wants. Um, we also want to drink pr plenty of fluids when we're increasing our fiber. Again, otherwise we can get constipated. So making sure we're getting enough fluids in too with that fiber piece. Um, the fruit, vegetables, whole grains we talked about. It's also going to be in those legumes and beans, lentils, those sorts of things. Tips to increase fiber, look for those breads or cereals that have quite a bit per serving on the food label. Eating fruits and vegetables with their skins on them. Or even adding beans to things already cooking at home, whether that's soup, salads, casseroles, what have you. All right, I have another question. Does anybody have any idea what foods really add to our sodium consumption as Americans? Condiments. Yep, condiments. Potato chips, yep, the, pra the package, <laughs> yeah. The processed foods, which we have a lot of, right? Those convenience foods. So this again is going to be that 2013 to 16, so a little old, but breaks down by where we're getting most of that sodium. We had sandwiches today, but the reason we had egg salad, tuna salad, chicken salad, those ones if we're making at home we can control more so how much sodium's in them. Like tuna, you can even rinse tuna to help decrease the sodium. Egg salad really shouldn't have a lot of sodium other than the mayo and if we're adding salt. But sandwiches, it's going to be a lot of the, they have different kind of sandwiches on here, but they consider like hot dogs a sandwich. Hot dogs are pretty high in sodium. Like if we're having a deli sandwich with meat and cheese, deli meat is really high. Processed cheese can be really high. Those sorts of things. Um, they don't necessarily have burgers in that sandwich category, but I would consider a burger a sandwich too, I suppose. Otherwise, yes, a lot of the processed foods, prepackaged frozen foods, um, they also have like rice pasta dishes up there. Again, a lot of the prepackaged processed um, like macaroni and cheese in a box. Some of those like rice aro rice is really high. If anyone likes that, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ramen noodles too it's another I mean you can make your own ramen at home and make it a little less sodium you know um, so average intake this is ages one or older in the US we average about 3,393 milligrams per day anywhere from about 2,000 to 5,000 grams per day uh, American Heart Association or a heart healthy diet they recommend 2,000 milligrams or two grams or less per day. So we're well over that. A lot of that sodium isn't what we're adding at the table or what we're adding at home. It's coming from those processed packaged foods or going out to eat. Uh, what else? It, it does a whole lot of things. That's why they add it to stuff. It cures meat, so that's gonna be things like bacon, ham, they use it in baking, they use it for a thickener, for flavor, to retain moisture. So that's why a lot of those prepackaged processed things has that sodium in it to keep it preserved. And yes, a lot of those mixed dishes too can add a lot of sodium. I have a little, a little tidbit about like casseroles on the next page to how to reduce sodium in those. Any questions on that? Okay. How can we reduce sodium intake? So 
If we're cooking at home more often, that can help because like I said, a lot of those restaurant foods have a lot of that sodium. Um, if we are going to the restaurant, I've got that way on the bottom, but we can ask for the sauce on the side. Maybe we ask they don't salt our french fries, things like that. We can ask how they prepare things. If we're looking at food labels, things that are gonna be lower in sodium are gonna be heart healthy, no added salt, lightly salted, unsalted, and I have those listed on your guys' handout as well. Flavoring foods with herbs and spices instead of salt, vinegar is better, um, citrus juices, citrus fruits for meat especially are other options as well. If we're buying fresh, um, those are really not gonna have a lot of added sodium. So, you know, not as much processed foods. Giving sodium the rinse. Um, I mentioned this with tuna earlier, but like if we're using canned vegetables, canned beans at home, you rinse them in cold water, that too can reduce some of the sodium on those. And then I found this out from a patient. That's why I like meeting with patients too, is they teach me things. It's great. Um, cream of chicken and cream of mushroom. That's gonna be in a lot of hot dishes, tater tot hot dish, those sorts of things. Campbell's now makes an unsalted version. I have yet to see it in the stores, but I know it's online. So that's something to think about too. Um, someone mentioned the condiments too. Yes, they can be quite high. You can find reduced sodium options as well in those. Um, if anybody cooks a lot of Asian type meals, soy sauce can be quite high. You can find reduced sodium soy sauce. Otherwise, I advise a lot of patients, there's something called coconut aminos. It tastes like soy sauce, typically lower in, the, in sodium, even lower than the low sodium soy sauce. But just be careful and look at the label because some of them can be quite high too still. Oil or vinegar on salads can help reduce sodium as well or making your own at home as far as like a vinaigrette or oil-based salad dressing. Um, and then reduce portion sizes or if we're at restaurants to either maybe just eating half a portion size or splitting with somebody, those sorts of things can reduce sodium as well. Okay, the nutrition facts label. This was redone in 2016. And I put it up here because it just kind of shows you the different changes they made. So they made servings per container larger so you can see it better. They also kind of update it to more accurately reflect what people eat. So that's good. They increased calories and made that bold so we can really see it. Sodium's on here, so if we're trying to reduce our sodium, watching that one. Um, they added added sugars as a subcategory below sugars, and like I said, these changed on the bottom here. That A and C is gone. Um, what else do I wanna say about this? Fats we don't necessarily want, that can add to weight gain, can cause our LDL or our bad cholesterol to go up, which we don't want. It's gonna be like saturated fat and trans fat. So watching those as well. And then added sugars is gonna be like what the manufacturer is adding back into a product where this example, total sugars is 12 minus 10 is two. There's still two left. Though it would be something called naturally occurring sugars. So that's in like fruits, some vegetables, dairy products, and possibly a little bit could be in some grains. Yeah. What would you what would you recommend for a label for saturated fats? Would you pick something that is 0.5 grams? If you're comparing labels, what would be a good thing? Yeah. I mean, how, like I've been able to get in that two or three grams, but I don't know what what is a good one. Right. So we can kind of talk about that too. This person. You're going to That's okay. No, 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 no. We can do it now because these are up here. This is good. This percent daily value. 
So that's based on a 2,000 calorie diet, but what we want to shoot for is like 5% or less is considered low. So that would be low in saturated fat, this example, where 20% or more is considered high. So this example would be high in added sugars. Any other food label questions? No? Okay. Does anybody feel like they drink enough water throughout the day? No, <laughs> I got to know. <laughs> One raise the hand, okay. It's a trick question, <laughs> yeah. Um, so water is important to keep us hydrated, right? To keep our body functioning, about 60% of our body is water or our weight is. Um, prevents us from being dehydrated, helps with digestion, helps absorb nutrients. I put up there, um, fluid intake is really calculated based on your body weight, but anywhere, I would say eight to 10 cups is pretty prevalent for most people, unless you are on a fluid restriction prescribed by your doctor. Um, tips to drink more water. Carry a water bottle with you throughout the day. Everybody got water mugs too today, right? Okay, so take that with you if you want. Make it a fun drinking glass. Try unsweetened sparkling water. Um, there's also high water content foods that can keep us hydrated. I know watermelon's not really in season right now, but cucumbers, lettuce, celery too are quite high. And then we can naturally flavor water with herbs or fruit. So there's a different, bunch of different combinations up there. Um, if I do anything at home, it's usually the citrus one, so like a lemon lime. But I've had this one on vacation before. That's really good too, strawberries and pineapple combination. Crystal light. That's usually pretty good because it's pretty low calorie, not a lot of sugar, but I would just peek at the nutrition label too to see if it's sugar or not. I don't think so. I think they're usually pretty low. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another way too to flavor water or they make all those like flavor enhancers now, the squirt bottles, and they're typically not that bad either as far as calories and sugar content. So cooking for one or two, um, this is because two as we age, usually we don't have kids in the house or anything, so it might just be one or two of us at home. Who's good about using a shopping list when they go grocery shopping? Okay, that's quite a few of you, that's great. So having a menu and knowing what we're getting can kind of keep us on track, which can help with budgeting. Um, looking for things on sale or coupons can help with the budget piece as well. Trying to only buy the food we will eat for that week will help with decreasing, throwing out food, so again, saving money. If we're cooking something like a soup or a casserole and it's just us at home, freezing it into single serve portions for later on is a good idea too, so we don't have to keep eating that same thing for a week or two straight. Um, buying in bulk and then dividing out into more single serve portions. My husband and I do that for, with meat just for cost saving too. Usually if you buy the bigger pack and you save them and freeze them for later, that saves some money as well. Fruits, veggies, you can buy them by the piece. Same with meat at the butcher counter. Um, you can get individual servings of pasta, grains, a lot of the dairy products too, so cottage cheese, yogurt, string cheese, etc. Maybe we're buying smaller bottles of condiments or sauces since it's just one or two of us. And then buying spice mixes instead of single spices too can just help with not having as much stock. Oh, I remember I put this on here for a reason. Does anyone know what these are? So. I believe you can get them on Amazon. They're called super cubes. So that's um, one of those things that you make bulk soup and you want to freeze in an individual serving for later. That's what they're made for. So they're silicone. You can pop them out once they're frozen. I thought that was a pretty cool idea. Otherwise, kitchen equipment for just one or two. 
Things like the toaster oven are pretty quick, an air fryer, a pressure cooker. Um, again, breaking down things, whether that's bakery items to freeze for later, maybe a loaf of bread, freezing some of that for later. And then if we're cooking our recipes too, doing the math and either like quartering or halving the recipe so we don't have to, again, eat that same thing for like a week or two at a time is other tips. The next thing I'm going to talk about is a little bit about food storage, food safety. Um, as we get older too, we're just more at risk for ha like getting foodborne illness. So making sure we're having food safety in the kitchen, no cross contamination, that sort of thing. Um, if a food smells off or looks off, it is best not to eat it. If there is mold on the food, I would advise not eating it. I feel I test these limits sometimes too. I'm like, oh, I just cut this mold off and it's fine. But I've read that it can like kind of pretty much integrate through the whole item. So I would just advise not to. Um, meat is gonna smell kind of weird if it's bad or the, what am I trying to say? The wrap on it might puff up. That's kind of a good indicator too, it's not good. Um, Keeping our fridge at 40 or below is good to keep food safe. Our freezer should be zero or lower. If we're cutting up stuff, making sure we're refrigerating it. When I say cross-contamination, we should not be cutting our vegetables on the same cutting board. We just cut our raw meat on, things like that. Um, use our freezer if we're not going to use something right away. Making sure we know what we have and using it in a timely fashion as well. Um, and then food product dating. I know a few years ago they were talking about like revising this because it was so confusing because all of the different verbiages. But as far as I'm aware, I don't think I've seen anything really besides best if used by and used by lately. Has anyone else seen these other ones, freeze by or you have? Freeze by? Okay, so maybe they are all still out there. They were going to try to consolidate that so it's not as confusing, but this is just the definition. So best of use by is actually the quality of the product for us to know. Sell by is for the store to know how long they can have the product on display. Um, use by again has to do with peak quality. And then freeze by is just when that product should be frozen to maintain peak quality again. So again, kind of confusing with all that. Um, I have this app on my phone, it's called Food Keeper App. It's green, it's from the USDA. If you guys are interested in something like that, it would just be in the app store. And it's kind of nice because um, it has all different categories of food. And like, say you look at chicken, I've had chicken frozen in my freezer. How long is it good for? And then it will tell you. So that's kind of nice. They also have a prepared uh, date. Do they? Prepare, see? They have a prepared date. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully they kind of consolidate that down at some point. I tried to briefly look it up before this. I don't think they've done anything recently, but. Um, this one is kind of nice. So this is on the American Heart Association website. They also have a handout called Seasons of Eating Too. If anyone's ever been a part of my cardiac rehab, you've probably received this. But this is just telling you where produce should be kept to stay freshest longest. So that's kind of nice. Um, what did I learn? So you're not supposed to keep your onions and your potatoes next to each other. Did anyone know that? Yeah. yeah. Otherwise they start sprouting. <laughs> you still do it though? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they're supposed to be in a dark, um, you know, room temperature place, but they're supposed to be separate. Bananas, too, give off a lot of ethylene gas. I don't know if they're on there. So they just can make your other fruits ripen really quick if you have them in the same basket. 
That's why I know there's those banana hangers out there. I've also heard there's tricks like if you wrap the top with saran wrap, they might not be able to give off as much ethylene gas. Or if you want something ripe, put it in a brown paper bag with a banana to ripen it, that sort of thing. Um, the seasons of eating one that American Heart Association has gives you what fruits and vegetables are in season at what times of year. So that's kind of nice. I don't have a picture of that one up here, but um, typically too when produce is in season, it's gonna be on sale. The winter time, I know citrus fruit is in season and it's, I've had oranges lately, they're pretty good. Um, those are all my resources. American Heart Association, I mean, is just good in general as far as healthy eating tips. And then the Dietary Guidelines for Americans is a lot of where I got my infographics. Their current guidelines are from 2020 to 2025, meaning they should come out with new guidelines in 2025. Their guidelines are just how do we make America better at eating as a whole and healthier. So they have different resources as well if you're interested in that. USDA has a lot about um, food preparation, food safety, that sort of thing. And that's it. Does anyone have questions? <laughs>